Very good afternoon to everyone and thank you for joining us to celebrate the launch of England's newest national nature reserve, the East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths NNR. I'm Kevin Cox, Chair of the RSPB, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's launch. The RSPB has played an active part in the management of the Pebble Bed Heaths, both at Aylesbere and Venottery Common, and as a conservation partner of the Pebble Bed Heaths Conservation Trust. I, I also live in Devon, uh, so it's a double privilege to be asked to welcome you all today. In the next hour, you'll hear from a range of speakers and watch some short films, which will give you an insight into the national importance of the Devon, Devon Heaths for nature. They're home to an astonishing 3,000 plus species, including many rare and special ones, such as the Dartford Warbler Nightjar and Southern Damselfly. It's a magical experience to stand on Woodbury Castle at dusk on a summer's evening and listen to the churring of the night jars. And if you're absolutely sure that nobody's looking, uh, wave a couple of white handkerchiefs above your head like a mad Morris dancer and the night jars will come round and fly right over you. The heaths are alive with buzzing, churring, singing and stridulating. Look out for the heath potter wasp that builds beautiful urns for its larvae out of mud, for the elusive smooth snake and the lovely silver spotted blue butterfly. But the heaths are important not just for nature but for people too. They're places of recreation and restoration for the thousands who come from Exeter and East Devon and far beyond. For many it's the connection with nature whether on foot or horseback or on bike that brings people back again and again. The heart of the pebble bed heaths is partnership. For example, grazing is critical to maintain the heaths in good health, and this only happens because of the close cooperation of all the stakeholders, including Clinton Devon Estate, the Pebble Bed Heaths Conservation Trust, Devon Wildlife Trust, RSPB and others. Across the country, Heathland has come under increasing pressure. Here in East Devon, we're fortunate that our Pebble Bed Heaths are in safe hands, treasured by their owners, partners, managers, and visitors whose work and commitment has been recognised and rewarded as a National Nature Reserve. The East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths truly fulfil the Lawton Report's call for more, bigger, better and joined spaces for nature. I'm delighted that we're joined today by a number of guests including Tony Juniper, Chair of Natural England and Marion Spain, Chief Executive of Natural England, John Varley, Estates Director for Clinton Devon Estates, and Sam Bridgewater, Head of Wildlife and Conservation for Clinton Devon Estates. But to start, I'm pleased now to introduce a short video from Lord Clinton of Clinton Devon Estates, the 22nd Baron Clinton, whose family have had connections with Devon since the 1500s. There is little doubt that the East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths and Commons are as precious to wildlife and to visitors as they always have been to generations of my family, who, as stewards of this wonderful part of East Devon, are responsible for handing the land over in a better condition for future generations. The commons have always held a special place in our hearts and in our minds. Until the 1800s, the commoners or commoners were tenant farmers on the estate who exercised their rights for fresh air, but particularly for grazing animals, to collect wood and heather and gorse. As demands for recreation and the world changed, uh, and space for exercise increased, and the use of agricultural declined, and my great-grandfather, the 21st Baron Clinton, who I knew well, signed a deed in 1930, giving the public the right of way of fresh air and exercise. All my family and I are delighted that this special landscape, the spine of the East Devon Estate, has been recognised as a national nature reserve. This declaration reflects the hard work of so many people across the estate and the wider community. And I thank them for all the huge contribution they have made and the passion which I share. And thank you to Lord Clinton for those introductory words. And now I'm pleased to be able to hand over to John Varley, Estates Director for Clinton Devon Estates, 
to tell us a little bit more about the new NNR. John. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you everybody for joining us on this very special day. I just want to give some background uh, to the journey to today, uh, the recent journey I've been on certainly, uh, for the declaration of this National Nature Reserve, which is truly exciting. On joining Clinton Devon in 2000, my predecessor's handover included a casual reference to an empty desk in the corner of a room, uh, which I was told belonged to former R Royal Marine Sergeant Major Bungie Williams, who, I quote, manages the commons and pops in on a Friday morning. It didn't take long for me to recognise that the pebble bed heaths were something pretty special. 1,100 he hectares of rare lowland heathland stretching between Exeter and the Jurassic coast, one of the finest geological and ecological sites in Britain, and much loved by local people for its amenity value, providing open space, tranquility, and a connection with nature. The site was an SSSI, an SAC, an SPA, and forms an important part of the East Devon AOMB, Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. It was clear that Bungie Williams and fellow warden Paul Swain were doing an excellent job when I joined Clinton Devon. However, we needed a robust long-term plan to ensure a sustainable future for these seven connected heaths and one more. My imagination was caught, and although I was appointed from my commercial background, I appreciated that I now had a new priority. In 2004, as Lord Clinton has already said, we revoked the 1930 groundbreaking original deed made by his grandfather, which gave the public right uh, of air and exercise. The revocation allowed the land to come under the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, modern legislation providing clarity on the rights and responsibilities of those using and managing the land. In 2006, we established the East Devon Pebbled Heath Conservation Trust, a charity to ensure transparency in the governance of the site. Since then, guided by our Board of Trustees, the Trust, in partnership with Clinton Devon, has made great progress in the sustainable conservation management of the heaths, notably gaining planning consent in 2012 to put up fencing to allow safe grazing environment for visiting herds of Devon red cattle and Dartmoor ponies. Now, under a countryside stewardship scheme providing public funds for the site, we are more naturally managing scrub to maintain the unique landscape in a similar way commoners would have grazed their livestock years gone by. Dr Sam Bridgewater, our Head of Wildlife and Conservation, and ecologist Leslie Curry have catalogued more than 3,000 different species of animals and plants living on the heaths and an extensive biodiversity audit published in 2016. And here's, a, here's a copy of it. This opened our eyes to the habitats being supported by these important lowland heaths and the abundance of species, significantly more than the four iconic ones we originally focused our attention on. My only criticism was there weren't enough photographs. We were blessed with a wonderful team. We are blessed with a wonderful team. Heath site manager Kim Strawbridge, Rangers, Paul Swain and Ed Lagdon, and Countryside Learning Officer Kate Ponting. The importance of the East Devon Pebbled Heaths cannot be overstated. They provide the vital link in a network of joint spaces, wildlife corridors across and beyond the estate that are key to rebuilding England's natural infrastructure, as identified by, by Sir John Lawton's panel in Making Space for Nature, published in 2010, which I had the privilege of being a part of. Ten years later, the Heaths have demonstrated beyond doubt during the COVID-19 lockdown their value to public health as local residents have flocked here for daily recreation and exercise. It is fitting that the East Devon Pebblebed Heaths have now been declared a National Nature Reserve by Natural England, one of the oldest and most respected designations, which today is ideal for the future as it inspires a huge sense of satisfaction and pride among local people, that this is indeed a very special place. John, John Varley, Estates Director for Clinton Devon Estates. So for anybody who's visited the uh, and knows the East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths, uh, their beauty and significance is undeniable. So we've now got an opportunity to sit back for a moment 
and to enjoy it in a short film. Two hundred and forty million years in the making, stretching across East Devon, from Woodbury Common to the Jurassic Coast, the Triassic pebble beds form one of the finest geological and ecological sites in Britain. The East Devon pebble bed heaths, 1,400 hectares of rare lowland heathland, home to thousands of species of plants, reptiles, insects, dragonflies, damselfly, birds, bees, butterflies, moths, and more. Many of them rare, many of them threatened, but safe in this haven of tranquility. Space for nature, connected corridors for wildlife. And a place for people too. 400,000 visits a year on land dedicated for public access since 1930. Managing this unique landscape and keeping vegetation under control are the visiting Dartmoor ponies and the herds of Devon Reds who tread and graze. Helped, of course, by the wardens, partners and dedicated volunteers. Now a national nature reserve, one of the oldest and most coveted declarations, so fitting for the future, to inspire a sense of pride and a duty for us all to care for this valuable place, to do today what's right for tomorrow. Some stunning views there of the East Devon pebble bed heaths from the ground and the air. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our special guests today from Natural England, Chief Executive Marin Spain and Chair Tony Juniper. We'd like to thank them both for making the journey to Devon to be with us today. Uh, we were, we've been up together on the heaths this morning. And I have to say it wasn't quite as clear this morning as it was in that film, uh, a bit murky and a bit wet but um, we're thrilled to welcome them now. So Tony will be saying a few words in a moment, but first uh, over to you, Marion, who will be officially declaring the new NNR. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to our host for today, the Clinton Devon Estates. As you said, Kevin, a magical, if wet, morning on the heats, and now wonderful to join our guests this afternoon. Um, 70 years ago since natural nature, national nature reserves were invented and they were invented to reserve, preserve as the word says, are the very best of nature and to be places of science and study. Over recent years, we've seen them more and more as that film has just shown us as also places where the public can visit the very best of nature. And now as we move into an area of nature recovery and begin to build that UK wide nature recovery network, our national nature reserves are absolutely at the heart of that network. Places so full of nature that it builds, brims out into the surrounding countryside. So how wonderful that 70 years on, we're still declaring new national nature reserves. The family is still growing and extending, and extending to be not just reserves owned and run by the government and by Natural England, but to be run as we see today by private estates like the Clinton Devon Estates in partnership with conservation charities. So it's a joy today to launch the 224th National Nature Reserve. Huge congratulations to everybody involved from Natural England, the estate, the RSPB and the Devon Wildlife Trust. I'm holding up now the official declaration just to prove it exists, and I'm going to read out the most important sentence. Natural England is satisfied that the said land, that is the Pebble Bell Peace, is of na national importance. And that is the official declaration. Thank you. Tony. Brilliant, Marion. Congratulations, everybody, on, on what is a, a landmark for this very special place. Uh, a few things have been said about the National Nature Reserve uh, designation this morning, but one additional thing I would just add, uh, and it's particularly 
uh, evident in the case of this particular one is how these designations increasingly are about effective partnerships. And indeed at Natural England recently, we redefined our mission to be about building partnerships for nature's recovery. And certainly what we've seen here and what we saw during the process of, of making the declaration on our board is that incredible level of collaboration that's going on here between the Clinton Devon Estates, uh, the RSPD, the Wildlife Trust, the Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, huge involvement from the community in volunteering to help manage the site and gather data and evidently very strong collaboration with Natural England and a, and a further thank you to our local area team who've been supporting the process uh, that led to the declaration today, especially our colleague uh, Denise Ramsey, who's put in uh, time over recent years to build up to the point where we now can make this uh, declaration of England's newest national nature reserve. And as has been pointed out, you know, we've had this particular uh, designation for our very best wildlife sites now, going back uh, 70 odd years to the founding legislation that enabled us to declare these uh, places. And over that time, we've included an ever increasing number of these wonderful uh, gems, the jewels in the crown of nature in this country to the point today where we have 224 of them covering nearly 1,000 square kilometers, which is a pretty big area. And I don't think we're finished yet uh, in terms of where we will uh, hope to designate new ones into the future. Uh, and as Marion said, you know, it, it's a, a designation that finds its origins in the post-war years, uh, in the late 1940s, when uh, places of special importance needed to be protected, including for their scientific uh, value, outdoor laboratories, and then also uh, increasingly to be of great importance to public access and for the health and well-being benefits that come from that. And of course, over the last year, we've just been reminded just how hugely important these places are for protecting uh, public health and well-being by providing that outdoor accessibility. But even though uh, they are seven decades old in terms of their original conception, they are very much a part of the modern conservation mission that we have. And this idea of building partnerships for nature's recovery is about rebuilding networks uh, of vibrant, rich nature. And at the heart of that for us at Natural England is the National Nature Reserves, like a battery pack that's going to electrify the wider countryside to bring back that nature that is now so depleted across so much of our beautiful countryside, but which could be more beautiful still, should it have the vibrancy of nature once more restored and for all those good reasons, uh, including public health and well-being. So this is a, a fantastic landmark, uh, a, another step towards that big mission of, of nature's recovery. And we couldn't be more proud, could we, Marion, in being able to support this process and hope that everyone uh, who is involved in the fantastic work here that we've had a chance to see today will find that their work is strengthened and the impact uh, deepens still further as a result of the Pebble Beds Heaths now being a national nature reserve. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marian, Tony, for those uh, really inspirational words and um, for all your support in uh, creating this new National Nature Reserve um, and for joining us today. Uh, the, the Pebble Bed Heaths um, wouldn't be the place it is today without the hard work of those who work here, who volunteer, who visit. Um, everyone has an important role to play in preserving and protecting this really special place. So we're going to have a look now uh, at the people behind the heaths. People are a really important part of the heaths and managing the heaths and keeping them as special as they are. So a lot of the species that live here depend on conditions being a certain way and to, to achieve that we need to manage the site. So all sorts of people are involved in managing the heaths as well as our site teams 
We have our regular volunteer groups, so both our own organisation but also the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust have their own groups. We'll try and link up where we can, which is always a really lovely social occasion to team up and, and hit a little bit of work. But we also have um, visiting groups that will come and give us a hand. So that might be local um, civic associations or brownies or guides or scouts, um, as well as even local primary schools have come and lent us a hand at times, which is always really lovely. Being an NNR will really help us reach out to, to the next generation, really, really clear message um, that this is an important space. Um, if they can value it and they can get involved, that's great either through learning or through volunteering opportunities, um, training the next generation of rangers, all of those will be really, really important parts of that. I got involved initially because I was out walking and I came across uh, Kate and uh, the party volunteers doing something. Uh, it was on the cliffs in Exmouth uh, and had a chat. And then she said, well, why don't you come and join us? And I thought, well, yeah, why don't I? You know, why don't I do something instead of just observing, as it were? I love being outdoors, so any excuse to be outdoors is, is great, so ticks the box for that. And, and just the social side of it, it's a really great group of people who come out and volunteer. Uh, and so the social aspect is equally as important as the environmental side to things. It's really important local space, it's really important for wildlife, and it's about tying that history um, that understanding of, of why it's special, um, preserving it, protecting it for the future and taking people along with us um, and, and them being part of the vision. That was great. I hope that gives everybody a sense of how important um, the pebble bed heaths are to a whole range of people and how important it is for people's health, for their well-being, for all the uh, the things that go on and how, how important the management is um, of the heaths. So now um, I'm going to uh, hand over to Dr Sam Bridgewater, who's Head of Wildlife and Conservation for Clinton Devon Estates who's going to say a few words. Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, John, uh, John Varley, he constantly teases me about the, uh, the biodiversity audit for the heaths and its lists page after page after page of them of every uh, creature that swims, uh, scuttles or flies. Uh, he's uh, from a marketing background and he wanted more pictures, of course, and fewer words, but uh, Leslie Kelly, uh, the co-author, and, and I have always remained entirely unapologetic about the long lists in the report. The East Devon Pebble Red Heaths is, after all, a conservation site of, of rare significance. And as such, we have a responsibility, um, indeed uh, uh, an obligation, to understand the biodiversity residing there and to look after it as, as best we can. And, and personally, I am absolutely delighted by the NNR declaration. I believe the site's wildlife credentials demand it and it's a credit to the staff of all the organizations involved in its day-to-day -day management that we've achieved it. Uh, although I'm a, uh, an ecologist, it isn't a ecological webs I want to speak about briefly now, but the more social webs. It's been a bit of a theme actually for, for, for this, uh, this launch because it's the social web that's provided the foundation for the declaration and which I uh, believe will ensure its success. Uh, many actors play on the NNR stage uh, the site managers, rangers and wardens who have responsibility for its management. And uh, I would like to name check again uh, uh, Kim Strawbridge, Paul Swain and Ed Lagden from our own Conservation Trust, uh, but also Toby Taylor from the RSPB and Edric Hopkinson from the Devon Wildlife Trust. They're all uh, long term dedicated servants uh, of the site. Supporting them are communication and education teams. And I particularly like to mention Kate Ponting here, who helps local communities connect to and understand the site. Then there are the, the hundreds uh, of volunteers, as the last uh, film showed, uh, from all partner organisations who assist in its management, the ecologists, citizen scientists who help with the annual wildlife monitoring, the researchers who provide the evidence for our conservation actions, and uh, the emergency services who keep uh, the public safe on the site, uh, and also the civic groups, such as the Otter Valley Association, who support conservation and education work. We have links with charities who use the site to raise money for good causes, local businesses, the Royal Marines, and of course, uh, the public. This is a, a heavily used site. 
And we've developed strong relationships with many of those, uh, most notably through the Friends of the Commons group. It's this web of relationships and diversity of interests in the site, uh, which we've now uh, uh, reflect is now reflected in our uh, new uh, advisory board that will help steer the NNR's development over the coming years. I, I sincerely uh, believe that by maintaining and building more links uh, within this web uh, uh, of human relationships, there's every reason why the Pebble Bed Heaths uh, can become the model of what a superlative modern nature reserve looks like. That's certainly uh, our aspiration. And uh, we have a vision for the site, uh, uh, which is uh, a place whose special qualities and rich history are understood by all, whose ecosystems are resilient, and where wildlife can flourish and adapt in the face of a changing climate. A place where society's ever-changing needs for recreation, health and learning can be fulfilled. A place where we can have all, all have confidence in its stewardship for future generations. That's, that's a vision I can believe in, and I think it chums well with the vision for National Nature Reserves nationally that Marion and Tony expressed earlier. This is uh, my, my favourite photo of the Heaths from a distance, and it's taken from Mutters Moor, actually an outlier of the NNR. If we uh, are looking to find hope of a nature-rich future, we can, I think, uh, find it in this scene. The River Otter that flows below the sandstone cliffs is now the home of beavers. Now, who would have thought that was possible 20 years ago? And a mile downstream, River Otter is about to be reconnected to its floodplain after 200 years and its original salt marsh and mud flat restored. The fields and woodlands we see centre stage in the, uh, in the fields, uh, around the fields, uh, are part of a government-led trial related to how we improve the environment through farming. For sure, there is lots of work to do. Uh, we can make this scene even better for wildlife. And centre stage, overlooking it all, the heaths. Uh, this newly declared National Nature Reserve provide space for nature at a significant scale and you can see it here. Yes it has great value for the species it protects but perhaps of equal significance is that its existence raised high in the landscape acts as a daily visual reminder for uh, all of us who go about our business in East Devon that our lives are richer when we allow nature more than the bare minimum area to exist. Nature uh, will come back when given half the chance and this and, and uh, all national nature reserves everywhere uh, can act as uh, as core areas from which we can expand nature recovery uh, across the, the landscape. Uh, thank you. That was that was great and uh, wonderful to see the heath set in their context of the wider la uh, landscape. So what are the future of the NNR? Uh, well, a new advisory board has been established to guide the operational management partners in the site's future. Each member brings a wealth of expertise and experience under the chairmanship of Chris Woodruff, manager of the East Devon area of outstanding natural beauty. We've asked each board member to share what they feel can be done today to ensure we're doing what is right for tomorrow. And here's what they had to say. By being closely involved in the management of the National Nature Reserve today, we can play our part in conserving and enhancing the natural beauty of this special landscape for future generations to enjoy. By thinking and acting holistically about the heaths for people and wildlife, we can safeguard its special character for the future. What we need today is a sustainable conservation model. That means that this unique place will thrive for all of us for tomorrow. By working with stakeholders and the public today, we will be able to enhance and improve this valuable landscape of the Pebble Bed Heaths to manage the pressures from increased public access and to protect this wonderful landscape in the future. Working in closer partnership as the Pebble Bed Heath National Nature Reserve today, Clinton Devon Estates with other conservation organisations will be able to provide a sustainable, collaborative approach for local people, wildlife and generations in the future. By protecting and restoring the heaths, the Devon Countryside Access Forum hopes that this will safeguard this very special place so that everyone can continue to enjoy it in the future. Our collective work we're doing now for nature on the pebble bed heaths is really enabling wildlife to thrive but it's also giving people with opportunities to experience nature every day 
and we hope that will enable them to be inspired to provide more space for nature but also more space for natural processes in the future. By bringing together our collective skills, resources and expertise to manage the exceptionally important habitats of the pebble bed heaths today, we will be able to make them an even more amazing place for people and their special wildlife in the future. The Pebble Bed Heath's new advisory board there with their vision for the new NNR. So it's now um, time to open the floor to questions for uh, Tony and Marion with our Q&A and um, uh, the both John and Sam from the Clinton Devon Estates team are on standby as well and I'm sure they'll uh, come in. So I'd like to start um, and, and I, before I start I'll just say if anybody does have any questions please do use the chat there's still time uh, to put any in but I'm going to start by asking Tony um, if you're there Tony uh, a question um, myself uh, I was really struck, Tony, when you said that the NNR is a battery pack to electrify the the, um, the countryside. Uh, I think that's a brilliant analogy, uh, and of course, you know, electrify where we're all moving towards. But I really wanted to ask you how you saw the NNR network fitting in with the Nature Recovery Network. What are they going to do, and how are they going to be part of your ambition, NE's ambition, government's ambition to see nature restored? Well, Kevin, so um, the happy fact is, is that the idea of, of the National Nature Reserves being at the core of a wider recovery effort, building out from those sites to repopulate the countryside, not only is that an aspiration, it's also a reality that is work in progress. And so, for example, last year we designated what is the first of uh, so-called super national nature reserves and we did that one in the Purbeck Heaths in Dorset where three former national nature reserves were combined into a single one by filling in all of the land in between them to create a single protected site of, of 30 square kilometres which is an incredible leap forward towards that analysis that Sir John Lawton gave us telling us that uh, what we've been doing uh, in conservation through protected sites for decades, it's been essential and it's been fantastic in what it's done, but it's not enough. We've got to recombine and reconnect. And so the Purbeck Heaths is one example of where we've now taken that step towards doing this in practice. Another one is the Great Fen in Cambridgeshire, where Woodwalton Fen National Nature Reserve on one side and Holm Fen National Nature Reserve on the other side are now being reconnected by a 30 square kilometre re-wetting of Fenland uh, undertaking. It's a very big project. It started some years ago. That's now really gathering momentum. Uh, one more uh, is the Avalon Marshes, where in partnership with RSPB and others down there, uh, very significant habitat creation going on around Shatwick Heath National Nature Reserve. And there are others across the country and we have many more uh, proposals in mind to be going down this route, including through the establishment of what is a very exciting government policy for the creation of so-called uh, nature recovery areas, 25 of them. And we're just looking at the potential to launch the first one of those as soon as next month. We can't say what it is yet because we're still into the details of working it through. But that idea of the battery pack, it's real and it's beginning to actually happen. And of course, it's not only the National Nature Reserves, they cover about uh, one tenth of the land that is more widely designated as sites of special scientific interest. But the NNRs, because of their iconic status, the fact that they are the very best of the best, I think gives them a particularly important role. And you know what we see here today, it's the step on a longer journey, a really, really important one. And I hope you know that wider thinking now will be given added momentum and impetus right here at East Devon through the designation of this new NNR. I wonder if I could add another example, Tony, of also of National Nature Reserves inspiring the landowners around them. So Martin down in Hampshire, the farmers down there told me they literally looked at the nature reserves, saw the wildlife, saw the plants, animals, butterflies, thought we want some of that on our farmland. So they've come together, entered into a countryside stewardship scheme 
to and are working with the nature reserve so that nature reserve is spreading out into private farmland and i think that will be the other way they'll act as that battery bag both inspiration and the source of the animals that will then move out into farmland things happening and as you've said earlier we've all talked about it's all down to partnership and partnership is going to make this happen and really get people mo motoring i've got another question here um which i'll read out uh, and i think tony if you can come back on this and then i'm going to hand over to john varley for his view on it but it's it, it says it's great to see clinton devon estates positive approach to the nnr designation of their land to managing land for nature and enabling people to get out and enjoy it how can we encourage more private landowners to also seek NNR designation? First thing uh, that will help is to showcase the fact that this can be very much part of a sound and sustainable business model for landowners because any land use uh, needs to be economically viable and if we are going to be moving uh, from one set of priorities to a new set of priorities including the recovery of nature then being able to show everybody that this is something that can work uh, in a business sense i think is is really important and so encouraging people to see this as not as an imposition uh, that's being put onto land to say you can't do this or you can't do that but to say actually this is a huge opportunity for you to be rebuilding uh, a future uh, at a time of really quite significant change in agricultural policy uh, changing expectations of society new science coming through telling us that it's not only food we need to be getting out of the land but a range of ecosystem services the more all of those things uh, shape the discussion then obviously the more important it will be to be anticipating that future and to see national nature reserves for many landowners as potentially a very important thing that they can do to, to make that work. I was actually on the um, Isle of Sheppey earlier this week with a famous uh, landowner there, Philip Merricks, who's been one of the pioneers in, in national nature reserves over the years. His was first declared in the late 19. 80s and what he's done amongst other things is is take an area of intensive arable and turn it into an area of intensive wader breed breeding it's quite incredible he says you know i i when i was a farmer i used to be all about productivity he said now i'm in conservation and i'm all about productivity and so what he's done is he's taken his mindset of managing the land in the very best possible way but from agriculture and into nature and what he's done at the same time is to turn it into a visitor attraction Thousands of people go there every year. He's got some accommodation. Uh, he's got a beautiful old Victorian barn where he hosts for wedding parties. And as a combination of the different business streams he's been able to put together, alongside some government uh, support and incentives, he's made a very good business for himself and for his family. And so I think landowners looking at this, um, you know, there might be an old fashioned view, maybe let's say that, you know, getting a designation of this kind, it means I can't do things. No, it's the opposite. It means you can do things and do things that fit with the world that we're just entering. and you have to be careful not to step on the uh, the lapwing chicks when they're breeding um john have you got something uh, just just, just briefly i mean thank, thank you kevin i mean tony's still on all my thunder um about three years ago i chaired something called the estates business group which is 28 of some of the larger estates in england and about 20 years ago I, i'd agree with tony any landowner that was offered the opportunity to be designated an ssi nnr would be uh, finding every, every way possible, uh, legally and otherwise, not to have that happen to them because there was the feeling this could be a constraining factor. Isn't it interesting um, that about three years ago, Holcomb Estate in Norfolk uh, grasped the opportunity to take over a National Nature Reserve? And if you look at their website and all their social media, they're, they're blowing this trumpet um, uh, that they, they've got one. Um, it's the GOAT standard. And uh, in many ways, whilst people look at landowners, traditional landowners, as something from ancient history, um, actually we're right at the, the, the cutting edge of the future. And with all the changes going on in land management and the way uh, we're trying to connect nature, uh, producing food, looking after uh, air quality, water quality, uh, having a national nature reserve on your patch uh, not just doesn't do something good for you, not only does something good for your brand, but it also really refocuses you on on, on the real opportunities to connect together 
uh, agricultural operations, forestry operations, and land management generally with, with this, this jewel in the crown, um, which gives you even further opportunities to, to make returns in, in a wider sense. And whilst we're looking for public money for public goods, uh, if this isn't what that is, I don't know what is. So I think my view is knowing the Estates Business Group members as I do, um, and seeing what Holcomb has done, what we've done here, there are, there'll be quite a few queuing up to try and get one. And it's up to uh, Tony and Marion to make sure the standard retain, is retained at the highest possible level going forward. We don't want to dilute our brand at Clinton Devon. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's a good thing. Let's hope so. Um, we've got questions coming in thick and fast. I'm going to group a couple just for speed. But uh, could Sam explain a little bit more what the government research is hoping to achieve on the farmland that he mentioned in the photograph? And also, um, I was going to say, Ma Ma Marion, if you can come back in, I'm sure you'll have something to add as well. In terms of agriculture, will the board be reaching out to farmers beyond the heathland to work with them on adapting their farms to improve connectivity for nature? So it comes back to looking at what we're doing currently here, but more generally, I think, Marion, if you could just comment on uh, policy around how we uh, we can change the farm landscape. Uh, okay, so uh, in in a trying to nutshell, um, our there's a number of trials across the country. Uh, ours covers about five thousand hectares and, and twenty farms, including our own organic organic dairy. And the idea was to work out what does public good look like. What does what do, what do the local people want from this landscape? So we got. Uh, stakeholders together, it included uh, the local parish councils, the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, Environment Agency, uh, local health hub even, uh, and talk about what was priority for them. We then packaged that and went out to uh, the farmers uh, and thought, okay, this is what people are wanting from this landscape. How can we deliver this? And, and the things that people wanted were, I mean, you can probably guess them, things like uh, um, uh, better uh, uh, support for, for, for farm and birds, things like soil buntings or, or, or yellow hammers and such like, uh, and better water quality, more organic, uh, uh, more organic carbon uh, matter in the soil. Um, and so we then pitched the to try and work out, uh, and we should have some baseline study on what habitats we've got, what's special about the landscape and what it is that we want to enhance, what's less good about the landscape and what we want to try and remove. And that's, and we've given up a plan and we're just sort of finalizing the plan now to go back to back to DEF and say, look, this is what a, what, a, what a scheme can look like. So that's sort of what we've been doing the last the last year. But it's been really, really good fun and actually really great engagement from, from the farmers who, who really want to play their part. So I think the big picture, Kevin, that um, John's already hinted at is this is idea that government mm. policy for agriculture is moving to paying public money for public goods. So paying for clean water, clean air, nature, access, and so on. But I don't think it's just what government wants. I think we're seeing more and more that the public want more nature. If, you know, the last year, the last year of the restrictions and people reconnecting with nature close to home, I think again, gives a real impetus for farmers who want to, to think about changing their business and thinking about putting nature higher up the list of crops that they grow. Tony gave an example there of Elmley, of a farm that's taken a very extreme view and is farming nature as their number one crop. But there are a range of opportunities for farmers to choose to enter different levels of scheme Teams. And I think what we've seen today, again, talking to the team we've been out with this morning, the farmers around here are starting to look at what's happening on the nature reserve and thinking, what can I do to contribute? I think it's also a real opportunity for farmers and rural, rural and urban communities to come together and do exactly what Sam was just talking about. So well, what do we want in this area? If when the Environment Bill gets through Parliament, the one that the Queen announced in the Queen's speech two days ago, one of the measures in that Environment Bill will be that all counties, all authorities will come up with a local nature recovery strategy. And that's the place in which farmers, the public, other businesses can come together and say, what do we want this place to be like? What do we as farmers need to do to create that? And what do other citizens need to do to create that? It's a really exciting opportunity. We're on the cusp of something at the moment. And we really, with uh, the environmental land management, with the environment bill, there's a lot resting on the way that government delivers on this. I'm just going to, to uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time. There's so many good questions. Um, I've got a couple here, which I'm, again, I'm going to link together. Um, if 
I can find them. This is a great development. The Southwest is not short of protections under law, but we're often poor at telling local people and visitors about why these areas are protected. What's your plan to tell the story of the pebble bed heaths and why they're important? And connected with that, uh, I think more, again, more broadly, what methods, tools will the new advisory board use to educate the 400,000 plus visitors of their responsibilities to ensure they can care for the NNR? Uh, and I think that connects with an earlier question I had on sensitive sites for wildlife. How do we balance encouraging people to get out and enjoy these sites without having a damaging impact? So I think there's a, a specific question about the, de um, the pebble bed heaths, but, but a, a wider one, which I'm going to come back uh, to you, Tony, on on how do we get people out into the countryside, but sensitively. So, John, do you want to come in on specifics of how we um, tell the story? Kevin, um, yes, the story needs to be told, and having the Brand National Nature Reserve makes it easier to tell it uh, and engage. We've set up um, the partnership board uh, and the representatives of that board um, uh, are uh, representative of a whole range of, of organizations and bodies and through those channels uh, we can we can engage effectively not just with our own um, the Pebble Red Heath channel but, but through a whole range of other channels so I think that the broadcast ability the channel to 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 many many thousands of people is there through through others um, I think we also for quite a few years now we've had the, what we call the friends of the commons we have about 500 uh, local people who've joined us uh, on this journey uh, and I think there's opportunities through the volunteers, 50, 60 of them who volunteer to work, but also the other 450 who, who just take an interest to broaden that and expand that significantly into the local community. So I think there's many ways we can do this. Uh, and the, the, the Pebble Bed Heath Conservation Trust, the estate and our partners uh, will be looking for, for ways of engaging widely uh, into, the, into the future and, and to explain um, how the land is managed and the rich tapestry of the landscape and its history which has got us to where we are today. Thank you. Tony, I don't know if you've got anything to add or anything more broadly. Or well, ju ju just on that question, uh, Kevin, about the, 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 the visitor uh, side and how we accommodate many, many people using these places. And, and of course, it's about integrating the conservation and landscape objectives with the public enjoyment. And, you know, I, I, I a story I heard the other day, um, going back some 30 years, uh, you know, it was the case that the official body looking after National Nature Reserves in those days uh, would send a box of signs out uh, to the owners of new National Nature Reserves and the signs would say, National Nature Reserve, keep out. And of course, that really isn't what the modern conservation job is all about. It should say National Nature Reserve, come in. Uh, but of course, what we have to do is manage the impacts of that visitor pressure so that we don't detract from the conservation value. And, you know, the, probably the biggest or one of the biggest issues at the moment is disturbance of ground nesting birds. So for a place like this with nightjar, there were once curlew, I'm told, in some of the valley uh, mires there. You know, disturbance is a big issue for those kinds of species. And at Holcomb, uh, was mentioned earlier, the terns nesting on the beach there and the, the ring plovers with dogs running about, this is actually really quite a serious challenge. So Marion and I were very pleased uh, last month uh, to do a refresh of the countryside code. So we put some guidance out there again, modernized it, uh, but really, it's, it's an ongoing painting of the fourth bridge kind of a job that we have to do now to be uh, reinforcing those messages, educating the public. And I think every National Nature Reserve, especially those that have a lot of visitors, have an important opportunity just to be reinforcing those messages because those people will come back, they'll go to a different National Nature Reserve. And the more we can embed this culture of responsible enjoyment, the better. And the reason we have to do this is not just because it's good for people. In the end, it's essential for conservation. So David Attenborough has pointed out that people won't want to protect what they don't love. And so having more people coming here is the biggest opportunity we've got for in the future society wanting to go even further than Marion and I are talking about at the moment. And so that synergy of public enjoyment leading to support for conservation in the context of managing that so that we don't damage the very thing that we've designated for in the first place, that's the sweet spot. And it's really in the end, public education, culture, and how we put these things together. 
everybody at the RSPB would agree with that as well. Yeah, it's how we uh, it, it under it underpins how we manage all our reserves. They are obviously for nature, but also for people as well. And we need to to, to give people a sense of you know, what it is that they they love and what needs protecting. So thank you, thank you to all our panelists there, and of course to Tony and Marion. Uh, um, we've had loads of questions, so thank you to everybody who's uh, put a question up. I'm sorry we didn't have time to come. Uh, and answer everything, but all of the questions will be passed on and followed up. So the pebble bed heaths, I think we've already heard, mean so many different things to so many people uh, who visit and use them. And last year, volunteer Andy Thatcher got together with site manager Kim Strawbridge and countryside learning officer Kate Ponting to devise a community photography project called The Heaths and Me. It aimed to reflect the important role and impact the Keiths, uh, the Heaths have had on people's lives. The public response was fantastic, as you'll see in our next short film from Andy Thatcher. Every day up here is different and there aren't areas that, um, it's, I don't know, are spoiled. Everywhere you go, any day, you can come here and see, see the, walk the same path, but it, you'll just get a different vista. You will see the sea in the distance, you'll see the clouds coming in, it's just different every day. So I think it's really special to, to have that and you could be up here for hours and never see another person. My granddad used to bring me up here all the time. So we'd go for walks all over the common and whenever we went out anywhere, we'd always end up coming back up here. And we'd sit and look out and just enjoy. I came up here with my partner, so yeah, the photo, he'd gone and stood in front of the car and I'd just taken the photo of him and actually thought that it was really pretty once I'd taken it. Ever since they were young we've always been an active family and always um, we've always lived in a place where we could be out that's that's one of our criteria for wherever we've lived and as they've got older we still manage to get out where well, regularly don't we as a fall just no other distractions really just walking along talking taking the air in isn't it really. This is a big part of my day actually so I work stuck behind a desk for eight hours a day and at the end of the day it was nice just to be able to uh, spend 15 minutes cycling through uh, sometimes longer if I get off the bike and take some photos. To me it just sums up the changing of the seasons that you experience when you're on the bike and uh, traveling through the common every day. When I'm looking after my children getting out and running is just my way of blowing off steam and um, connecting with nature um, and just sort of enjoying what we've got around us. A photograph that shows the variety of colours and textures within the, in the common is, reflects how I feel about it and how you've got different zones and different areas that sort of provide different things depending on what you're needing. I was very um, impacted, I would say, by the fire which happened on the common in April. In fact, the day it happened, I was walking over near Crediton and I could see it on the skyline from there and found it really quite scary. But it is part of the kind of regenerative cycle on the commons. So in the winter, when um, the snow was here and the black stems of the burnt gorse was against the snow, I took a lot of pictures that day. It was Boxing Day, I think. And um, yeah, I, I suppose it's a relatively rare scene and the black against the white seemed very striking and I was also thinking about uh, regeneration because um, you know in uh, the old philosophies there's a, a period of blackness and then there's the white cleansing sort of time clearing out like happens in the winter and then we get the golden flowers on the gorse eventually so to me although it looks a bit bleak it's actually very optimistic. During our um school years we used to take part in the annual school walk and you'd start off in the in your first year at secondary school being able to walk the 10 mile and then actually you progress to being allowed to take part in the 20 mile walk 
what's lovely about the photograph is that that I'm there with my school friends you know Mary and I were, you know first met when we were at primary school not right at the beginning because I, I moved to Devon from 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 Sussex when I was five and a half so but from from then we'd been friends and we're friends all the way through through secondary schools. Big sense of achievement I think to, to actually complete the 20 after doing the 10 for a couple of years it was a, I think from memory it was a big thing to do the 20 it felt like mm. a big thing a big step up. For me I guess the photographs it sort of encapsulates sort of growing up and um doing things with 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 people that you like and 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 i guess challenging yourself as well so my photo is actually uh, near the end of training in the commando phase of training and the photo was the induction to the endurance course itself where we were brought round um by the section commander at the time we were two section 539 troop and the picture was us coming through peter's pool behind me now um as part of that induction I still to this day don't know who took that picture because I actually came across it a couple of years later in 4-2 Commando in the library um, where it was just inside a book that I just happened to open. So it was fate really me coming across that picture. The Royal Marines have been training here now uh, since the Second World War and there's not one living Royal Marine who's not been exposed to Woodbury Common and that was my first exposure and to this very day we still test the Royal Marines with their determination, their grit, their field craft all on Woodbury Common. Um, so it is Royal Marines is what the Heaths mean to me. Uh, I'm lucky enough now to live local so I do get to see the other side of the common um, rather than just Royal Marine training. It's a really lovely film there from uh, Andy Thatcher and it gives a, a sense through the photographs and through their words of how much the um, pebble bed heaths have meant to, to so many people and throughout their lives as well. So um, that brings us to the end of our virtual launch today. Um, thanks must go to Clinton Devon Estates for its vision and commitment to this special site which has resulted in this declaration. Thank you especially to Tony and Marion for making the trip down. Thanks to John Varley and Dr. Sam Bridgewater and to all of you for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, uh, at the event it's been recorded um, and a link will be emailed to you over the coming days. And a special commemorative online edition of Clinton Devon Estates Countryside Matters magazine has also been um, produced to celebrate the NNR declaration. And we'll be sending you a link to this as well. Uh, please do share this link with your networks. Um, goodbye.